Previously on World History and Geography. In the early 17th century, the unified Japan had shut itself off from almost all contact with other nations. Under the rule of the Tokugawa shoguns, Japanese society was very tightly ordered. The shogun parceled out land to the daimyo, or lords. The peasants worked for and lived under the protection of the daimyo and a small army of samurai. This rigid feudal system managed to keep the country free of civil war so that peace and relative prosperity reigned in Japan for two centuries. And now, our feature presentation. There is a lot for everyone to see in Japan today. Look, there's the Imperial Gardens, the Meiji Shrine, the Hello Kitty Factory. But Japan was closed to foreigners throughout the 1700s. But beginning in the early 19th century, Westerners tried to convince the Japanese to open their ports to trade. British, French, Russian, and American officials occasionally anchored off the Japanese coast. Like China, however, Japan repeatedly refused to receive them. Then in 1853, U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry, no, not Matthew Perry, <laughs> Commodore Matthew Perry, who took four ships into what is now Tokyo Harbor. These massive black wooden ships, powered by steam, astounded the Japanese. The ship's cannons also shocked them. The Tokugawa shogun realized he had no choice but to receive Perry and the letter Perry had brought from the U.S. President Millard Fillmore. Hey, he does look like Alec Baldwin. Fillmore's letter politely asked the shogun to allow free trade between the United States and Japan. Perry delivered the letter with a threat, however. He would come back with a larger fleet in a year to receive Japan's reply. That reply was the Treaty of Kanagawa in 1854. Under its terms, Japan opened two ports at which U.S. ships could take on supplies. After the United States had pushed open the door, other Western powers soon followed. By 1860, Japan, like China, had granted foreigners permission to trade at several treaty ports. It had also extended extraterritorial rights to many foreign nations. But the Japanese people were angry that the shogun had given in to the foreigners' demands. They turned to Japan's young emperor, Mutsuhito. He seemed to symbolize the country's sense of pride and nationalism. In 1867, the Tokugawa shogun stepped down, ending the military dictatorship that had lasted since the 12th century. Mutsuhito took control of the government. He chose the name Meiji for his reign, which means enlightened rule. Mutsuhito's reign, which lasted 45 years, is known as the Meiji era. Hey, did you know the Meiji Dairies makes chocolate bars in Japan? I must be getting hungry. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. The Meiji Emperor realized that the best way to counter Western influence was to modernize. He sent diplomats to Europe and North America to study Western ways, and energetically supported following the Western path of industrialization. By the early 20th century, the Japanese economy had become as modern as any in the world. The country had built its first railroad line in 1872. Coal production grew from half a million tons in 1875 to more than 21 million tons in 1913. Meanwhile, large state-supported companies built thousands of factories, making Japan competitive with the West. Japan also modernized their military. By 1890, the country had a few dozen warships and half a million well-trained, well-armed soldiers. It had become the strongest military power in Asia. Japan had gained military, political, and economic strength. It then sought to eliminate the extraterritorial rights of foreigners. The Japanese foreign minister assured foreigners that they could rely on fair treatment in Japan because their constitution and legal codes were similar to those of Western nations. His reasoning was convincing, and in 1894, foreign powers accepted the abolition of extraterritorial rights for their citizens living in Japan. Japan's feeling of strength and equality with the Western nations arose. As Japan's sense of power grew, the nation also became more imperialistic. As in Europe, national pride played a large part in Japan's imperial plans. The Japanese were determined to show the world that they were a powerful nation. The Japanese first turned their sights to their neighbor, Korea. In 1876, Japan forced Korea to open three ports to Japanese trade. But China also considered Korea to be important, both as a trading partner and as a military outpost. Recognizing their similar interests in Korea, Japan and China signed a hands-off agreement. In 1885, both countries pledged they would not send their armies into Korea. In June 1894, however, China broke that agreement. Peasant rebellions had broken out against Korea's king. The king asked China for military help in putting them down. Chinese troops marched into Korea. Japan protested and sent in troops to Korea to fight the Chinese. This Sino-Japanese war lasted just a few months. Oh, by the way, Sino means Chinese. In that time, Japan drove the Chinese out of Korea, destroyed the Chinese Navy, and gained a foothold in Manchuria. In 1895, China and Japan signed a peace treaty. This treaty gave Japan its first colonies, Taiwan and the neighboring Pescadores Islands. 
By the start of the 20th century, Russia and now Japan were the two major powers in East Asia. The two countries soon went to war over Manchuria. In 1903, Japan offered to recognize Russia's rights to Manchuria if the Russians would agree to stay out of Korea, but the Russians refused. In February 1904, Japan launched a surprise attack on Russian ships anchored off the coast of Manchuria. In the resulting Russo-Japanese War, Japan drove Russian troops out of Korea and captured most of Russia's Pacific fleet. It also destroyed Russia's Baltic fleet, which had sailed all the way around Africa to participate in the war. The treaty ending the conflict gave Japan the captured territories. It also forced the embarrassed Russia to withdraw from Manchuria and to stay out of Korea. In 1905, Japan made Korea a protectorate. Japan sent in advisors who grabbed more and more power from the Korean government. In 1907, the Korean king gave up control of the country. In 1910, Japan officially imposed annexation on Korea, or brought the country into Japan's control. The Japanese were harsh rulers. They shut down Korean newspapers and took over Korean schools. There they replaced the study of Korean language and history with Japanese subjects. They took land away from Korean farmers and gave it to Japanese settlers. They encouraged Japanese businessmen to start industries in Korea but forbade Koreans from going into business. Resentment of Japan's repressive rule grew, helping to create a strong Korean nationalist movement. The rest of the world clearly saw the brutal results of Japan's imperialism. Nevertheless, the United States and other European countries largely ignored what was happening with the Japanese.